Okay, so now we've started the recording. I will minimize that. And we will get going. This is Creating Engaging Easter Services. My name is Paul Clifford. I'm from TrinityDigitalMedia.com. And in fact, let's... talk more about that. This is a screen cap of my author page on Amazon.com. I've written a couple of books. Here they are, Podcasting Church, The Serving Church, and Tweeting Church. Those are all available at any time if anyone's interested. And uh, this is the church that I go to, Quest Community Church. I've been there for over a decade. And when I started Quest had about 100, 150 people in attendance. Now we're around 4,300. Now that's not because I'm great or anything. I just happened to have been there when it happened, so I saw a lot of the steps along the way. So why creative services? That's a really great question. I think that uh, primarily the best reason is because God is creative. If we go back to Genesis, in the beginning, God created. The very first thing that we have God ever doing is creating. And God wasn't he wasn't content just to create one kind of anything. He's always creating new things. In fact, if we look at Isaiah, see, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? And that's who God is, and that's how he interacts with us. So why shouldn't we be creative in how we worship him? Why shouldn't we be creative in how we help people to understand the gospel? I mean, some people say that they're not creative, but I think that Scripture itself says the opposite. Remember, the first thing God did was create? Well, the first thing we know he did is create. Well, he also said, let us make man in our image. So we are made to be like God in that he's creative. So it all starts with an idea. Ideas are the basis for creative services. So... You might be thinking, well, where do you get these ideas? Well, you can get them by brainstorming, by bouncing ideas off of each other. Now, we don't want necessarily good ideas. We want what God wants for us to have, because that's really the whole point. You could have an incredible service that isn't what God wants for you to have, and you've accomplished absolutely nothing. Or you could have a very simple service that that's exactly on task with what his plans are for you, and you can change everything. So I think that that's really an important component of it. Let's talk about language and audience. Depending on who your audience is, your language should change. This is something that... Um, I hear a lot of people have some tension with, and I really don't get why, because the language that you use should be understandable. That's one reason that Jesus used parables, is because it helped make things of the kingdom of God understandable to people. Other people heard the same parables and didn't understand them, and he was incredible in that way, that he could craft things exactly for the right audience. So let's talk about the history of one of our services at Quest. First off, we have an order of service that everything flows from. Now, that is created as a result of a brainstorming meeting where we get out a bunch of great ideas 
But, of course, when you have 300 ideas, there's no way you could do all 300 in a single service. So we have another team that goes through and gets the best stuff out that they feel God is calling them to and builds an order. After the order is created, then it's time for practice. Now, the different elements can be used in a service. So, of course, there's prayer. Of course, there's singing. Of course, there's a message. But there are other things, too. So, we could have uh, what in the old days they would have called skits. Uh, at our church, we call them dramas. Uh, we could have what they've called in times past testimonies and uh, we call them faith stories real life faith stories or just stories and those can all be crafted together to help the pastor just be ready to go when he steps up so he doesn't have to introduce the idea that he feels like god is having him teach the idea has already been introduced, and it's already touched people in ways that speaking the message won't. We're whole beings, and different techniques impact us in different ways. And what's very important for this is that you need a team to reach these people, that nothing is done by just one person. Sometimes I would wish that you could accomplish great things with just one person, but when you think about it, there's a lot in the Bible about community. So of course it's the case that a team of people all seeking God can accomplish much more than a lone individual could. So it takes people to reach people. And You've got to envision people for them to want to be a part of the team. I think that there are probably people in every church that are just dying to do this. They just have no idea that it's even possible that they were created for the specific purpose of making the truths of Christ more clear through the arts or through whatever their giftings are. So what's the vision of your church? I think that everything ought to flow from that. If you don't have a vision, then you can kind of flow willy-nilly through things, wondering, um, so should we do this? Should we not do it? That's an important question. So back to practice. You've got to know what you're going to practice before you practice it. Unfortunately, you can't just show up on Sunday morning five minutes before service. At least not if you want something that's well done. And I think that well done things show that things are important. So after we've done our practicing, we have kind of a three-step process. We talk through, and that's where we go through the entire order. Then we do a run-through. That's where we actually do everything in the order, in order, uh, except for the message, but everything else. And we check sermon notes to make sure that if we've got to make sure that there aren't typos and things like that. And then the leaders of the teams get together and talk about what happened to make sure that there aren't any rough spots. Maybe something seemed like a good idea at the time, but in seeing it, we realize, okay, we must have heard wrong because that's that wasn't good at all. So that is kind of the three-step process. And after each service, we return to a blitz to say, okay, what did we do? What mistakes were made? How can we do this better? 
at the beginning of the following week after services are over and everything, there's a production meeting where we kind of revisit everything from the previous week, look for hits and misses, and plan for the next week. So just as a quick aside, I'm going to be doing a class here very soon called uh, the Creating Church Boot Camp, and that's going to be a pretty intensive thing. So it's going to be about a month long, daily email lessons, weekly audio chats, and weekly video messages. And I'm going to do that for uh, $97, bit.ly slash creating church boot camp, if anyone's interested. And feel free to pass that along if you think you know someone who is. So, back to creative services. I think what you really want to do is make an experience. And not because you want to be theatrical or entertaining, but because if something is important, it needs to be engaging. Engagement is what makes important things stick. So an example of this is what I call invading the person's week. And what I mean by that is when you use something that someone is likely to encounter in their day-to-day -day life other than in church, a lot of times they'll have a moment where they have recollection back to how your church used that. So if so a, a traditional example of this is if you sing Amazing Grace on Sunday morning and then uh, someone goes to a funeral and they're singing Amazing Grace, the person might remember the topic of the Sunday morning. Well, you could also do that with other things. So you could do that with secular music because there's a lot of times that there are messages in secular music where they're, they're longing for something more transcendent. And that's because everyone has a God-shaped hole in their heart, of course. So you could use that and when someone who goes to your church happens to hear that song, they're taken back. You could use a video clip from a movie. When they happen to see that movie, they're taken back to your church service. So that's an interesting way to do things is try and plan for opportunities to invade their week so that their relationship with Christ can't be just about Sunday. That they're always hearkening back to what they've learned and how they've interacted with the message of Christ. So I've heard people complain that this is a more creative service is baby food. Oh, I want something deep. I really, well, let me give you an example. A certain man had two sons. And when he was old enough, one of the sons said, Give me what's mine. He packed up everything he had, and he moved off to a far country where he used all his money on a partying lifestyle. About the time he ran out of money, a famine sprung up in the land. And as a result, he found that he had to take a job feeding pigs. He was so hungry that he longed to eat what he was feeding to the pigs. One day he came to his senses and realized that the servants in his father's house always had enough to eat. So he decided then and there that he would pack up, go back to his father's house, beg to be a servant, because there he at least wouldn't be starving. While he was still a long way off, the father ran to the son, wouldn't let him say his speech, and instead told the servants, 
bring out a robe for him, bring out slippers, put my ring on his finger, because my son who was dead is now alive. Now, of course, that's the story of the prodigal son, but when you think about it, that's just a story. It's not a deep exposition with big words. I told this story just from memory because it's so impactful and so incredible. Why? Why wouldn't the church want to do more things like that? There's another thing at play, I think, and that's the important versus the interesting. You see, people think that if something is important, they don't have to make it interesting. But actually, the opposite is true. If something is important and it's clothed in, in an engaging way, people are more likely to retain it. And they're more likely to think, oh, this must be important because someone took the time to do it. Have you ever seen an educational video or something like that where it was just really, really boring? Someone thought it was important enough to make it, but they didn't think it was necessary to make it engaging. I think that that's really the challenge that the church faces, is we've got to make things engaging. Not because we're trying to entertain, but more we're trying to help people remember important things. So real quick, this picture is uh, one I got off of uh, photopin.com. And I just wanted to give credit to Lorraine Santana because it's so great. Even though uh, this is Creative Commons and I'm free to use it, I just love it and just wanted to share. So this is what it actually looks like without me dulling it down. It's not a great picture. So real quick, I wanted to give anyone who's here uh, 10 brainstorming techniques. If you go to this web address, the upper and lower case letters are important. So it's cl.ly slash capital N as in Nancy, capital F as in Frank, capital D as in dog, and lowercase p. So that's about it, but let me ask if there are any questions or anything like that. Let me go down to here to the questions thing. I think I really sped through it that time a little faster than I did uh, last Thursday. So it seems like there might be some more details that I've left out. Um, let me think here. I do remember that last Thursday when I asked this, someone was, uh, I had a couple of people ask a couple of questions. They were church, uh, church planners, and one of them asked, um, one of the church planners asked what she could do in her little house church where they had only 12 people. I said that uh, she could hook up a computer to an HDTV and just do basically a slideshow on PowerPoint with music. Uh, another was meeting in the back storeroom of a store, and she asked how they could make it look nicer. And I said, you could hang up fabric, use pipe and drape, if you're familiar with that, things like that. So... Let's see, Tony, you've got, 
when does the team typically rehearse the order of service? We, um, the musicians, do their rehearsal on either Wednesday or Thursday, typically Wednesday night, but not always. So Thursday is the backup to uh, when, if we can't work, uh, if we can't practice on Wednesday night. And let's see here. Yeah, the run through, I, I should have been a little more clear. The run through is actually, we get there early the day of the service. So in the case of a Saturday evening service, we'd get there Saturday afternoon, do a practice, a sound check, that kind of thing, make sure everything's ready to go. And then we have the the talk through where we talk through the order in it. The, there's someone who's in charge called a producer um, and the producer who's in charge of such things um, answers any questions that you might have. So that's what the talk through is about. And then we run all the order in order, trying to make it as close to an actual service as we can. Like, you know, not stopping if we don't have to stop. And um, again, that's before service. So if the Saturday service starts at 6 o'clock, it would be about 4.30 or 5 when the run-through would be. And that gives us a little extra time that in case a transition didn't work quite right, we can tweak that. We can go back through it. But we don't want to stop the first time through. We want to run it through in its entirety and then make note of the rough spots and fix those. And that might seem like a lot of work, but it's better to take an extra couple hours and get it right than to be embarrassed because there's some unforeseen glitch or, oh, I found out that I actually need three hands to do this thing that I thought I could do. You know, that kind of thing. Yeah, the practice does involve the tech team as well as the musicians because the musicians need the tech team. So, so for example, uh, at our Frankfurt campus, the on Wednesday nights, usually we have a video person and a sound person. The video person is there because there are often video elements that go with songs. And so instead of having the sound person run those, the sound person can just concentrate on making the sound sound good and the video person can run things. When it comes to practices, well, that's practice. When it comes to a run through, everyone's there because you don't want anything unforeseen to happen like, oh, well, I showed this video and, oh, it was horrid. Or I wanted to have the video up and it just didn't work. You know, things like that. So that's the advantage of having everyone there for the, the practice, the kind of secondary practice, the talk through and the run through is you can all be on the same page for everything. Anything else? Well, I guess that's about it. So thanks for showing up. I'm sorry that uh, things didn't... Somehow I was much quicker, and maybe it was more engaging that way. I, I suppose it's better to 
Well, this is one of the things that I live by. It's better to have people um, asking for more than saying, when will this be over? So I hope I accomplish that. You're welcome. Okay, I'll go ahead and shut it down now. Have a good night. Um, I'm hoping to do some more classes and, uh, and all. So if you haven't registered for my newsletter, um, head over to bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash podcast church free and you'll get a free electronic copy of my first book and you'll be registered for my newsletter and I send out announcements and free stuff and coupon codes and all I've been working on uh, more comprehensive classes that I'm using an online service to do so I'm hoping to include some coupon codes for those okay well, thanks a lot.